fully up front. The aim of this episode was to tell the story behind the good start by Anaheim. Instead, that attention-grabbing burst from the gate by the Ducks is just a complimentary piece as part of a conversation with first-year head coach Greg Cronin. He's one of the most interesting and honest people I've ever spoken with. You don't have to be a Ducks fan or a hockey person to absorb this episode of The Chirp with Darren Millard. Boys, I'm Mike today. Just let everyone know, don't say anything stupid. Heads up! Oh, how'd that feel, old man? What are you going to do? You! <laughs> really growing on me, Stammer. Really starting to grow on me. Hey, did you know Anaheim won eight games in a row a couple of years ago? Didn't factor in the playoffs. It didn't lead to being in contention for a postseason berth, but just a reason to tap the brakes just a little bit when it comes to the Anaheim Ducks. So we'll get to... Uh, Greg Cronin in just a little bit, but wanted to go down a path of great starts and teams that are out of the gate with authority. And Boston is there, Vancouver, Tampa Bay, and Arizona all jump to mind, along with the Vegas Golden Knights who uh, set all kinds of records uh, out of the gate. Uh, Boston, how do they follow up 135-point season with this? Very differently. Not scoring nearly as much, but keeping the puck out of the net. Vancouver's doing both, leading the league in goals also uh, right there when it comes to fewest goals allowed. Thatcher Demko alongside the Elias Peterson and what they've got going on in the back end with Quinn and uh, Hironik uh, is just awesome. Tampa Bay without Andre Vasilevsky, stick taps uh, there in Arizona. I didn't think it would work. I didn't think it would translate into being relevant early or in the mix midway through the season, but they added a bunch of veterans, and I, I like what's happening with that group and the progression that's taking place. So a similar path, uh, bringing in some older players, some guys that have been around to what Detroit has done, uh, just backfilling in and around their youth and waiting for everybody to ripen up and become that young exciting team that uh, the Red Wings are going to be. Uh, they're taking a, a cautious and a uh, a slow approach there with Steve Eisenman. Arizona's kind of doing a little bit of the same thing. Uh, I wouldn't put them on equal uh, planes right now, but I can see some some similarities. Uh, Arizona moved over from the Pacific Division a couple of years ago. They're in the Central, which I think is uh, pretty wide open. Uh, Colorado, Dallas, and then who's going to fight for the final playoff position or maybe two. Uh, the Pacific Division uh, is, uh, I think, going to be a dogfight all year. Remember a year ago, people were talking about that being the weakest division in the National Hockey League, uh, but they were wrong. Everybody was wrong. The Stanley Cup champion came from the Pacific Division. Uh, Edmonton had a marvelous season uh, last year and uh, really thought that they were going to push into a Stanley Cup final situation. This year, even though the Oilers have struggled, I think the bar in the Pacific, believe it or not, has been raised, even with Edmonton dropping back. Uh, Vegas, Los Angeles. Los Angeles went into Vegas and, and won a game. They are just grooving on the road right now. And Vancouver, again, uh, what they've been able to do with Rick Tockett holding people accountable has been Awesome to watch. And being great at both ends of the ice, is it maintainable? I don't think they're going to score like this. Uh, that's easy to say by me. But uh, I, I like the structure that I'm seeing out of them. But the, the big team, the surprise team, uh, above 500 is is Anaheim. Uh, this is the Ducks situation. They haven't made the playoffs in a couple of years. A few years. Maybe a handful of years. Anaheim hasn't made the playoffs in so long Two different teams have come into the league, and one of those teams has won the Stanley Cup. It's a drought in Anaheim. And they've wandered around a little bit before finding their niche with some skill. And then this year, some structure with Greg Cronin taking over. This is a very interesting and fun story from Greg Cronin. 60 years old, first-time head coach in the National Hockey League. Really late to be making your debut in a league which I think is going younger and younger. We're not to Paul Maurice at 28 in Hartford yet, but uh, certainly uh, guys getting looks uh, when they're in their early 40s. Greg Cronin probably thought, well, we'll ask him if he thought 
his opportunity at being a head coach in the National Hockey League have passed him by. But we also get into some really cool conversations about Anaheim. How did he get these guys to play more structured? And he's very honest about speaking to them face-to-face and laying down the law. And then there's other conversations and topics that uh, just kind of come out of the discussion organically. And it's a fun, fascinating conversation that I think is one of the best we've ever offered up on the Chirp Podcast with Darren Millard. Let's start with what's happening right now and how much of this start is expected or a surprise? Well, I mean, I, I as an individual, set high expectations, whatever I do. Um, I mean, it's been well documented. I'm a 60-year-old coach. But I've coached a long time. And uh, those experiences have, I think, given me some wisdom in terms of how to put together a rebuild like Pat and I had discussed before I was hired. Um, the tricky question is how quickly can the players grab onto some of these fundamental pieces that need to be visible every night and every day for this culture to actually get legs and start going. Um, in the beginning of training camp, Darren, I'm not going to lie to you, I was worried. Uh, Brent Thompson and I coached together in New York you know, a, a decade ago, and in different experiences I've had, there was a Toronto Maple Leafs or the Islanders in the late 80s or late 90s, I should say, and Colorado with the uh, Avs and the Eagles I, and those comparisons, I was like, wow, are these guys way behind these other teams I've worked with at the NHL level uh, in terms of being able to execute these foundational pieces. Um, but surprisingly, after the first night, I thought we had a little bit of maybe stage fright, whatever you want to call it in Vegas, our first game. After that, um, you know, we, we picked it up quick. I, and be, I'll back up a little bit. So we actually want the last team to play a game. Remember that? In the start yeah. of the day, like we were a week behind Vegas. So that was their third game. That week before we played Vegas was a week that I could really drill into what I what we wanted out of these guys in terms of standards and execution, in terms of the strategies. And um, we had a big camp. We played a bunch of games. So we didn't really have an opportunity to work with our core guys. And that week prior to Vegas, you could actually see some traction take place um, and how we were going to coach this team to a level where we felt that that any team was capable of playing. And as I said earlier, like which guys respond at which rate, that is going to be a work in progress. After that game in, in, in Vegas, we came back the next night and played Carolina. And um, we were humming that first, like half of that game, we were humming up and down the ice. And I was like, okay, good. Like Shazam, they They've kind of figured it out, and let's see if we can sustain it. And that's kind of where we're at right now. So what is different about the system that got them going in the right direction? Well, I mean, I I know Dallas, and I, and I co- actually coached Dallas in the, in the 90s in New York and coached against him in San Diego. He, he's a great coach, a great person. Um, you know, I think I think watching their team last year and I, and speaking to the, the, the coaches that were here, I, I texted Dallas, but um, Mike Stubbers and Newell Brown, you know, they, they didn't start off really well. So they were moving, trying to adjust the systems or change the systems to make the players perform better. So I think there was just a, there was a little bit of confusion on how they were going to play, how they were going to defend. And, uh, and I've been on these, Darren, like I, you know, you get in these, uh, you might've been in Toronto when we had the, we had that, uh, that epic game seven loss in Boston that yeah. year in the playoffs. And then the next year, you know, Dave Nonis and his staff kind of changed out a lot of plays and, you know, we, we were expected to finish high, and it was, you know, Berkey would call it a train wreck. A train wreck started creeping down the hill in the mid-February, early March. And it, it's, hard to, it's hard to get the train back on the rail. And I think last year that happened to this group. So there's obviously systematic issues that are damaged, and psychologically there's damage too. Um, so we just basically – I just try to make it simple. I, I don't really – I'm not reinventing the wheel here. We just try to make it very simple – and hold guys accountable to roles within a very simple system that will allow us, number one, to defend. Like, I wasn't worried so much about generating offense. I think that comes from defensive commitment. Um, and you could see guys figuring it out. There was things we did that were a little bit different that made them think differently about how they were going to defend. And as they started to get comfortable with it, 
I, I could just see the game started to slow down for these guys and they could defend quicker and they could react quicker to the plays on the ice. Was it a learning the system or buying into the system? Because there's differences there. It's both of them. Yeah. It was, it was a, quite frankly, a simple message. It was both. And I think they, but again, they're starving for discipline. They're starving for accountability. They're starving for structure because when you come out of the chaos that ensues in an NHL season, when the train goes off the tracks, you know, the human, any human being, they want to go back to a foundation, a foundation, a base level. Okay. Where are we starting from here? And um, we made it perfectly clear that we were going to start from this foundation and we have to execute this foundation to build this thing up from the ground up. And, and I think they understood that. We, we've got a nice mixture, whether it's Silverberg, Henrique, or Fowler. You know, Killorn was a big addition. Gudis, older guys that have gone through this process where they had to reinforce the messages that the coaches gave them. Has it changed your expectations going forward? It has, but I'm also, again, I'm, I'm an older guy. I, I, I don't get, you know, I, it's nice for the organization and for the team to get these, these, this, the credit we've gotten early. Like I'm pissed off. We didn't win last night. I want to be eight and four, not seven and five. Uh, and at the same time, I'm looking for, a, I'm looking for a long, a, through a long wins here. Um, this is shot in the season. It's early. Like this doesn't mean anything. Okay. What it does is it shows that they're capable of executing at a high pace and actually come back from from losses, which is critical that they can battle through adversity and win games. But it it just it's a small sample size. It's our responsibility as coaches and their responsibility as players to continue to move this forward every day. Like it can't be okay. Wow, we have a good start. Whoop de do. We're seven and five, right? That's my mentality. Is so what are we gonna do to get better the next day? I know it's a lot of hyperbole, but it's true. Like if you if you really 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 passionate about getting better you get better within the structure that we're creating and it's up to them individually to follow the direction and execute it how do you stop them from being satisfied because seven and five even though you want to be eight and four is still a big step towards being positive yeah i'm not going to be superficial here like we won a few games we probably shouldn't have won on the phone the road trip but we want we should have won a few games at home we didn't win like so i i a reason why I say it is because it's always going to go to the process, right? It's a process driven thing. You hear that a million times. You hear the word culture, process, culture, process. I mean, they're there for a reason, right? They're popular terms. The execution of them is what's tricky, right? So I, I continually focus, we as a staff continuously focus on the process. There are games that we're going to lose that we should have won. We just played a team, Pittsburgh, that's at the bottom of their division, but analytically, they should be near the top of their division. I know that going into the game. I'm sure Sully and his staff are preaching that to the players. You don't need to change anything. So on the reverse side of that, it's the same mentality. And um, the sell for me is real easy. Like every individual has goals. Like Mac T comes out to a great start. He's the talk of the NHL. And and he and I and I talk to that kid like he's dialed in. He wants to continue to get better. Ryan Strom has kind of rebranded himself. Like, he's off to a really good start. Okay, good. What have you done for me lately? Keep pushing it. So our challenge, you know, to maybe I'm, I'm walking this too far ahead of the, the dialogue here, but my challenge is to get more out of our defensemen. How can our defensemen contribute more offensively? We're just, we're not getting enough out of our D-men. So there's a way that we can actually improve and create more offense. If you're going to, are you buttoning it up? I'll, I'll start there. Are you, are you trimming it down and being a lot more simpler? Yeah, for sure. Okay. Like our, our our D zone is our priority. Like we we kind of start and begin everything with our defensive responsibilities. So how does that impact uh, like a Trevor Zegris, who is such a free spirit, both with his game and personality? If you again, he's another guy analytically, he's way ahead. He was where he was the last few years, like way ahead. Like And, and that, that expected goal thing is a reflection of your attention to detail defensively and your offensive production. Right. Mm -hmm. So. We've asked him, like when I when I when I got the job and I did the research prior to getting it and I spoke to Pat, he was the guy that I was most worried about in terms of creating a, a defensive um accountability to. Mm -hmm. And then how is how is that going to impact his offense? Okay. So if you look at his numbers optically, it's like, wow, this guy's got two or three points in eleven or twelve games, whatever it is. What's going on there? Well, I think his offense is gonna come defensively he is completely committed to it his teammates see it and again i used to use the word teammates a team sport and he's bought into the fact that the team's having success despite the fact he's not scoring 
but he's getting his chances. Like he seriously could have eight goals right now. He's getting chances, but he's not scoring. So uh, I think is, and I, I really like like him. And you you use the word he's you know whatever the word is expressed is his personality. He's a very creative kid. Yeah. Okay, kind of like an artist, right? He's very creative and he likes to. He likes to uh, make creative plays and and uh, use his stick to create magic on the ice. That's all great. He's he's getting chances, and they will come. I think his scoring will come. But I'm more proud about him with him about his his team first mentality that he's demonstrated the first few months here. Did you ever think that uh, you were going to be a National Hockey League coach in the last couple of years? Had you given up on that dream? Well, I. Yeah, is it? It's a good question. Like when I was in the American League back in two thousand and three, four, five, I was. Yeah. I saw John Stevens the other night after the game. He and I were coaching against each other. He was in Philly, and I was in Bridgeport, and we were chuckling about, you know, the coaches back there. John Paddock was coaching in Binghamton back then. Robbie Fatorik was in Albany back then. Trent Yanni was in Norfolk by himself. You know, the American League, no assistant coaches, <laughs> and um. Like, you know, we're like the last of the dinosaurs from that generation when the league was rock 'em sock 'em robots. You know, you had 11 forwards and two of the 11 forwards are just out there to hunt people down for fight, right? That game's over, right? And I'm fortunate. Like, I I, I went off that that path to go to college because Boston's my hometown and Northeastern would be a good place to kind of put some roots in the ground. I just didn't like it. But it's a long, long-winded answer. Like, I went in for the Bruins interview a year and some change ago, and Jimmy Montgomery got the job, and Jimmy obviously has done an awesome job. And Don did a great job picking him. But at that one, I didn't get the interview then. I thought, this might not be my time. Like, hey, but the, the end of the day is I love coaching. I love working with players. I like working with, with this case, a lot of kids here. We got seven kids, 22 years and under, under five kids that are 20 and under. And like in the American League, there's a lot of unbelievable coaches in the American League. That's a hard job. Like you're getting your best players are getting plucked up when there's injuries or they want to make a change up top. And then you're pulling players from the East Coast. There's a lot of moving parts there. And you have to think on your toes. And I enjoyed every minute in Colorado. That Eagles organization is outstanding. Um, so if I didn't get the job, I was I was happy where I was at. Like I just enjoy coaching. I enjoy inspiring, changing people and watching people grow. Why do you think you didn't get some of those jobs? Because your resume, you've coached every year since 87. Um, I have my theories about that, but like, I'm not a real social guy. Like I'm not a, I'm not a press box parasite that kind of goes up and clings on to people and talks to people. And there's nothing wrong with that. Honestly, I wish I had that ability. There are mm -hmm. guys that are really good at marketing themselves. They get their names out there. Um, it's just not in my DNA. I tend to just stay in my footprint and I maximize where I'm at. Um, I'm not a, I'm not a name drop a phone call or I just don't do it. I just kind of, I do my job and I was brought up that way in my Irish Catholic family in Boston. And that's, that's how we did it. And that's how I, I conduct my, my life. So like I, you would like to think that when you do good things, you get rewarded. And I do think I've been rewarded. Like I don't have any regret. I have no resentment. I'm just really thrilled to have the opportunity that Pat Verbeek saw our talent meet when we had our long interviews, and he thought that talent would mesh well with what he's trying to do here with a rebuild. So, hey, I'm I'm happy as can be. What do you think won over Pat? Because he's an intense guy. You're an intense guy. That feels like the bond, was it? Yeah, it's funny because I joked about this at the press conference. You know, Pat's a Sonia, Western Ontario pig farmer, and I'm an Irish guy from Boston, from the city, right? So you have these two personalities that are polar opposites. He played, you know, thousand plus games in the league, and I didn't play a, you know, a minute in the league. So, but we we have the same mentality in terms of just trying to exhibit change in people, right? And Pat, Pat's a grassroots guy, and um, I I really think that when we talked, it was a nice balance on, and you know, like when you're trying to do something, I don't care what it is, like it starts with a vision. Like I was fortunate to, to start the U.S. National Training Program there in Michigan with Jeff Jackson and Bob Mancini back in 96. And that was a vision that we had sitting at a table in, in Ann Arbor, Michigan, me, Jeff, and Bob, and Scott Monahan still here. And um, that vision actually blossomed from what the heck is this? It was such a radical thing back in 96 to a premier program that's spitting out first-round draft picks. Well, each of us had different personalities and, and and they weren't as close as Pat and I are in terms of how we see things, but we worked it out and it meshed really well. Pat and I kind of hit it off in terms of where we felt that critical DNA was. 
to create change. And obviously it's, it doesn't, you can't, you, you, you're not going to miss that with Pat, right? His DNA is, is really like hard, hard hockey work habit, play fast, finish your checks, like win puck battles. That's Pat's DNA. So he's trying to create an image here or, or a system here that reflects that. And I coach that way. And so when we talked, you know, you have these, and I'll give you another comment that you asked about the, you know, why did people get hired? I don't know. But yeah. Pat, Pat did something that's very interesting. Okay. And I've asked people about this. So we had this long interview and and we went right to it. Like the joke was we sat down for five hours. It was in between playoff games in Palm Desert. We were playing Coachella Valley. I was with uh, Colorado and we sat down for five hours on a Monday. I didn't even open up my notebook. Okay. I had my my notes in preparation. He didn't ask me the only, I've been on a few interviews, but usually they're structured on questioning and there's, there's pivot points on questions that the general manager and the search committee are looking for that are going to reflect what they're looking for in the answer. So you can manufacture what you want, but again, going back to that authenticity, Pat and I just, he had questions. I didn't know what they were. He was kind of playing like the wizard of Oz guy behind the curtain, right? I didn't know what was going to come out of that. So I was just kind of waiting to see what he was, what, where he was going with the conversation and let it evolve organically. So when we were talking, he would ask me questions that had, had a lot to do with hockey, but I knew they were loaded. Like he wanted to know, okay, well, how? Like if you forecheck this way and you believe in hunting people and pucks down, how do you do it? And then what do you do it when this happens? So when he was asking those questions, I didn't open my notebook. I didn't need to. Like I've been around a long time. So we got right into the detail. Like nobody ever asked me these questions, the detail of what happens on impact on a check, for example, what's your goal the next two seconds? Like that's deep stuff, right? And you can skin a cat different ways. So this is just I shoot my way of doing things. So then the next interview, he asked me to do video on how, how I was going to execute systems that he felt were core systems to create that vision of how you're going to, play fast or hunt pucks down or possess pucks right so these are all very universal terms in hockey but how are you going to do it so i had this i had video like you know seriously like i had like i don't know probably like 400 clips of video from from possible questions he was going to ask me and that last interview we met for seven hours we went in at 1 30 and we left it was dark out and um and I still didn't know if I had the job, but I knew that we were talking and he would ask questions that I felt he saw as a player that I presented as never playing, but I saw players execute at different levels. And I knew at that point that if I was hired, he and I were going to get along really well. So how do you want to do, sell yourself to a general manager, but you maybe don't have the players to to follow through on that? Like there's a there's a push pull there. How do, how do you handle that as a coach? That's a good question. So I didn't I didn't share this with you either. But he asked me to go through his players, and he wanted mm -hmm. me to watch the games. So I watched uh, five of the games the Ducks played, and I picked them up from the beginning where everybody's coming out of the starters gate full speed, right? The beginning of the season, it's like a 100-meter 100, 100 dash, and everybody's going hard. Yeah. And I got the – you know, I just basically did the first month and the second month and the third month and the fourth month, and as the – season went on everything was deteriorating right but i watched the players so i was able to see players perform when you know they were going pretty good early i saw them play the bruins early it was a good hard fought game they lost in overtime and then at the end i saw guys kind of like mail it in so for me watching it from a distance without having a personal relationship with the guys i saw which dna was reliable who was going to compete whether whether they're five and five the first 10 games or they're 20 and 50 after 70, right? I could tell who was going to do it. And then I would ask Pat, okay, what's this guy's DNA? I see this and that he would tell me like, you're hundred percent on here, but I think we can get more out of him if we put this button. And I, when we when we went through that, we went down that rabbit hole and talked about these guys. I said, okay, I think, I think we can do it. And I asked him and I, and I, when I got the job, I asked Newell and Mike, you know, can these guys, do these things and they said unequivocally yes but you're ahead of the game in the sense of those guys in the back of your mind would probably be already on notice they may not know it but you know it yeah i told them that when i met with them i met with oh, them you all. did yeah when i got the job i drove back to boston i had to fly back to colorado and get my stuff and then when i drove back there i met with i think it was 12 guys i i, I usually rip back there in three days but i took like five days on this trip and i um i sat down with them and i i had 
It was great time. It had the information. It was raw. It came out of my interviews with Pat. It was given some flesh by Pat, right? Okay, okay. So when I was talking to these guys, I I just, you know, you have your 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 whatever, your, your introduction, and then I just got right into it. Okay, here's what I know about you. And I and I and I know when I talked to some of these guys, it was like they get hit with a fastball right between the eyes. Mm-hmm. And I tried to put some rubber on it so it didn't hurt too hard. But I just said, this is what I hear about you. And then and then then I asked them to explain it to me. And I knew when I talked to these kids, and I'm not going to get into the intimate details of the conversations, I knew who blinked and who didn't blink. So the guys that blinked, I knew maybe needed a little bit more work to get them to buy into what I was trying to challenge them to be as hockey players and how we were going to play. And then I kept going back to them over the summertime, texting them. Where are you at with this? Where are you at with this? Because I'm a big believer that we are, we repeatedly do. So I can have a conversation with a guy right there, and it's a great conversation. It's that old expression, you can have great ideas, great visions, and you go into the shower. By the time you drop off, you forget them, all right? Yeah. So so, so your job is once you once you plant these seeds in there, you got to fertilize them. And the fertilizing now in this generation is texting them, calling them. Where are you at with these things? I gave them direction to do off the ice. What are you doing off the ice to be able to cultivate these things that are going to make you prepare for training camp? So I'd keep going back to them. And I think when I, when I got to camp, I think there was an understanding between me and them what the expectation was in terms of compete, in terms of effort, and then how I was going to translate off the ice into their habits off the ice. Because I had talked to the strength coaches as well. I went down and visited the strength coach that kind of is the – he manages this. He's like the general manager, John, John Bowers, down in Florida. And um, and I is Mike Bowers and, and, and – um, I have a friend named John, but Mike, it, it, Mike was the one that was constructing all this. So I went down and watched him train. I said, you're not training hard enough. You know, like that's not good enough. And Mike, Mike mirrors that. So that's how we get a little bit of homework before we started. We've been around each other. I don't know you well, but I was in Toronto. You were in Toronto. So we're in the same universe. Uh, but in doing my background on you, it's just you're intense. Have you mellowed over the years? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, how much? Think, um, honestly, like you know, I don't need to go into like details here, but like um, some events happen in life. Like this gets you know, off the rails here as far as hockey goes. But um, yeah. I got fired by in New York. Um, I I tell the story. Um, you know, it was me, Dougie Wade, and um, Kelly Buckberger, Luke Richardson were there. Scotty Gomez yeah. was there, and um, and it was a weird, it was a weird season. Like Cappy was there the year before. It was me, Cappy, Dougie Wade, and Bobby Corkum, and then. We had 200 point seasons, and then it went a little bit off, you know, went sideways a little bit, and then Snowy got let go, and then Lou came in, and then the ownership had changed. Charles Wong had transferred ownership yeah. to the current group, and um, and I had um, you know, like I got humbled, like I got fired. I was a very confident coach, you know. I'd been a penalty killing guy, and we had some great, you know, seasons and records and blah blah blah, and and um, I got fired at the end of the year, and I was really, and I, I don't think Lou Lamarell meant any ill will by this. He's probably fired a lot of people, and. But I went in there and I, um, funny story, I was surfing. I'm a big surfer. I was surfing on Long Island and um, and I get called in and I had my board shorts and flip flops. So I went to Lou's office. I don't know Lou. Like, I mean, he's, you know, he's a Providence guy, a Boston guy. He was at Hockey East at Providence. I was there at Maine and Northeastern. But, I, you know, I, I, I know it. You know, you know, he's coming, right? The brief is coming. There's a coaching change and you're, you're probably not going to be part of the transition. So I asked him why he's firing me. So I asked him, what he knew about me and he really didn't know much about me. Okay. And I'm at the time I'm 55. And, um, I, I was, I tell the story. It's kind of funny, Darren. I go, you know, that movie Christmas story when Ralphie wants the BB gun. Yeah. 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 And he goes, and he goes, he waits for hours to get to Santa and he's too nervous to ask him about his BB gun. And then by the time he's about to get kicked down the slide, he grabs Santa's boot and he says, I want a BB gun. Yeah. <laughs> he says, You're not going to get a BB gun. Shoot your eye out, kicks him down the slide. <laughs> That's what I felt like I had, I had loose boot <laughs> trying to <laughs> kick me out the office and I wouldn't let him go. Right. So, so anyways, I, uh, I just, I came out of the office thinking, Whoa, like, I don't think this guy knows who I even am. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, I did a little, you know, and he had made the recommendation that I get it, you know, go back to the American league. I said, Lou, I was there in, in 2003. And I said, I didn't get dumb the last, whatever it was, 16 years. <laughs> okay. So, but if you want me to go back there, I'll go back there. So I didn't expect to go back there. I was fortunate Joe Sackick and and um in uh C Mac and Craig Billington gave me a chance in Colorado. But long story short, so 
that summer, you know, I, I'm a sober person, okay? That summer, my parents died back to back. And um, it was in people that have lost parents, it's a very strange feeling. You can't practice for it. You can't have an interview with a, you know, the Grim Reaper or God and say, what do I do when this happens? It just happens. And people that are listening know this, right? So it was like one shoe dropped. My father, you know, God bless him, fell down a set of stairs and fractured his head and died. Um, and then my mother was left and she was, I think, 80. And then I was, I had gotten the job in Colorado and it was before I left. And then I left and I was gone for two months. And um, my mother died suddenly, like she, you know, I think it was from a broken heart. They were married for like 56 years. And um, this is a weird thing to say, and maybe this isn't the right venue for it, but we're here talking about it. So I had this real change, like a spiritual shift, you know, like about the finite nature of life. You know, you lose both your parents and it's like, whoa, like, you know, I, I think young listeners think life's infinity. You go on forever, right? Young coaches, you get fired, you get another job. Like, it was a moment in my life where I just had these, you know, and I'm a very spiritual person, but it kind of added a tangible nature to life to me and to, to try and value it every day. And so in that in that, in that that valuation of life, you've got this, for me, I'm an extremely driven person, this desire to drive and excel and to promote and inspire change, not just for hockey players, but for other people. And at the same time, understand, like, this is why wisdom is so important to step back from all those, those interactions and those events and look at them from that perspective, like a godlike perspective, like, hey, this is very important. But really, when you step back, like, what role is it going to play in a larger scale in life? So instead of just focusing on everything for like that day, I started saying, okay, how can I, how can I inspire change that's going to be long lasting? And give people messages that are going to allow them to be better people and better teammates. And I maybe I flirted with that before, but I kind of made that one of my core principles. And this is another strange thing. And I didn't expect this conversation to go this way, but like it's got to come from a position of love. Like if you frame everything through a position of love and not ego, because I think I was a bit of an egomaniac before. Like I don't mean that in a real abrasive way, but I just think my own private way, I wanted to win everything and, 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 and control everything. Like, like if, if you, if you, if you look through that lens, if you frame it with love, there's a different response from the players. They know it. I use that word authenticity. They know it. And then when you can be hot on people, if they know that the outcome is love, like you want them to promote or, or to, to progress and, and have better, you know, better performance, better lives, better teammates, you know, tangibly better salaries, all these things come together. I think if if the root behind it is from love. So I know it sounds corny, but, you know, I it, it's, and again, ironically, I, I get the job here and then, you know, 12 days later, my sister dies from alcoholism, you know? And again, it's another reminder, you know, she's 56 years old. Like there's a bigger thing out there besides winning hockey games. So you're a different person now. Are yeah. you a different person than you ever thought you would be? Yeah, I mean, you can put a scale on that one on a scale of one to 10. I would do, I mean, I'm not like, I don't think I've gone from one to 10, but maybe I've gone, I've gone from five to seven, you know, like I think I'm a better human being. Yeah. And you're more patient? Yeah. Yeah. More patient. Like, so it's like, how do I, how do I, how do I demonstrate that as a coach? I listen more. I pause before I react. I circle back to people to make sure they understand the spirit of the message. I constantly communicate them so they understand that I'm in this with them. It's a collaboration. It's a marriage. Um, you know, texting is a wonderful way to connect with people. I'm able to read people's, you know, and I think everybody does this, but I prioritize reading body languages and going to see people before that, before they get to a point where they're getting discouraged or they're losing confidence. Um, that's something I've learned from that over the last five years. And the American League was a great place to do that because the bus rides, the we had a lot of airport travel to sit down with players and talk to them at the airport, ask them how they're doing. I mean, I can tell you what players, you know, their wives, their kids, how many kids they have, what their activities are. That's very important today. Kids need to know that you care about them and you know about them. I really didn't think about that six years ago. So when you got kicked out in Pittsburgh the other night, this is my way of getting to that. Was that you with the intensity or is that you buying in with your players and showing them that you're all in? 
It had nothing to do with the players. Uh, I mean, it, it, it wasn't. I mean, it was obviously I was more frustrated because Ross Johnson's a friggin' unbelievable team guy. He's a he's a heavyweight fighter, and he scored a beautiful goal. Between you and I, I was pissed when that that went in, and I thought it was a good goal. I never saw the overhead piece of it. Um, I reacted like I would have reacted 40 years ago when I was in Boston, okay? I was like, you know, upset. Felt it was like the wrong call, and I was just angry, okay? And the anger came from I wanted the goal. Okay, I'm going to use the word I. I wanted the goal because yeah. I wanted our team to win. And we had been okay during that period, but that was a goal that could have given us a two-goal lead. I regret my actions. I shouldn't have sworn. I don't think it's good for the game. I don't think it's good for the audience. I don't think it's good for me as an image. Um, and I regretted it. Like if you, the funny thing is, after I did that, I was quiet. Okay, like he, he gave me the two, and I was pissed off, and I used some poor language and my body language. And you don't know this, Darren. You don't know where the camera is. Like I didn't, I didn't script it right. And then, and then I, you know, when I got thrown out, I just, I just gave him a, you know, a thumbs up. I didn't think it was a big deal, but, you know, again, I, I regret doing it. I'm really proud of the team. They responded in that third period. But, um, yeah, I mean, it was just – like I said to, you know, Colin Campbell, I said it was a regrettable 20 seconds. It wasn't a big thing. It's like, it wasn't like it went on and on and on and on. It was a 20-second 20, 20 burst, and then it was over. And I asked that question because sometimes managers or coaches do do that. Managers in baseball uh, will try to get in front of that to, to give the team uh, the heads up. I, I love that it was from the heart and reactionary. Yeah, I, did. I there was no semantics there. I just did it. By the way, Ross and I played uh, golf this summer. He's a PI guy, so awesome dude and uh, amazing person. And just he, but he, that dude is into golf. Like he, he manages every part of it uh, as much as he does his hockey, uh, hockey career and hockey approach. He probably hits it a mile for golf. A, a ton, like ridiculous. Oh. <laughs> kind of bugs me. Um, a uh, Bob Ewell. I don't know whether really you remember that name recruited you to Colby College. Yeah. And you went as a football player and a hockey player. I did not know this. And then yeah. you just went down the hockey avenue. And yes. Nate Ewell, his son, is my boss uh, on oh. my day job with, with Vegas. And I got that notice uh, as I walked in here today. So amazing how things just connect in the world. That's unbelievable. Bob Ewell, so you can tell Nate this. I remember his dad, he was, he was a thickly built guy with, I think, thick, dark, curly hair. And my brother and I, my, my brother was an unbelievable athlete. He's a better athlete than me. And we went up there to play football and hockey. And the football team was horrendous, okay? So I figured the team was so bad, I probably wouldn't make it through the football season to play hockey because I wanted to play hockey. <laughs> <laughs> they went like 0-8 or something. I don't even know if they had a first down the whole year. They were horrendous. So you're a football guy, like like uh, all in? I don't watch the NFL. I watch college football. Okay. Hey, where do you think – um, what's a successful year for you? We'll leave it at that. Make the playoffs. That's a big step. I know, Darren, but that's expectations. And, you know, that's the expectation. And that's, you know, I don't, again, I'm not trying to be arrogant or, or, or anything like that. But, you know, like I, I joked around, like, do you coach any youth teams or anything? Yes. Okay. You guys have playoffs at the end of the year? Yeah. You guys tell you're going to play for brownies and in, in, in milkshake? Or you're going to play for the playoffs? You're going to play for the playoffs, right? Okay. You want that there medal, you man. There you go. That's the way I look at it. We'll get brownies and the milkshakes if we make the playoffs, too. Okay. <laughs> well, you you know what? You've given a lot of people uh, real inspiration because you stuck with it. And I'm, I'm really happy for you. But I'm also uh, impressed by uh, your, your loyalty to the game. So I, I want to thank you for that. And good luck this year. Yeah, thanks, Darren. I appreciate it. Boy, that'll leave you. Thinking, talking, passing it on to people. You got to hear that interview Greg Cronin did on the Chirp podcast because uh, that was fantastic. It exceeded all expectations. I go into it. You have questions that you want to ask. You, you're, you're expecting some answers. You might have to push. You might have to uh, follow down a path. You might get taken down a different path. But that was uh, that was fascinating stuff from, from Greg. And I am one that will now watch the Anaheim Ducks with a much – more appreciative eye and um, root for them in a sense uh, to see where they're going to go uh, with this this group and whether or not they can make some noise halfway through the year. It's too early in the rebuild. 
And I know what Greg's saying. He wants to win. It's too early in the rebuild. I, I think Edmonton finds their game. I think uh, Calgary can can make a push. Uh, just better players, more veteran players in that group. Anaheim's going to be fantastic, young, fun, and uh, all kinds of entertainment in there. But can you really do that? Can you go from having the uh, lowest points total in the National Hockey League to being in there and winning your way to a playoff spot? Uh, it's going to be tough. Like Boston, like the challenge for Boston this year was following up the best record in the National Hockey League, the, the highest points total ever in a regular season. I didn't think they would come close. So maybe, maybe Anaheim's got a chance because Boston's responded. Tampa Bay survived uh, without Andre Vasilevsky. Good job by John Cooper. They're getting points. They're putting stuff in the bank. Uh, I love uh, what uh, Arizona's done, bringing all the veterans in. That was a calculated uh, approach by Arizona. They're above 500. Then there's Vancouver, just score. Vancouver, uh, Pedersen scoring, uh, Besser scoring, uh, JT Miller uh, putting, the, putting the puck in the net. And the accountability, the structure is there from, from Vancouver. The structure is there. That is different. That's what Rick Tockett was brought in to do, was uh, make sure that there was an approach that they could replicate game to game from a system standpoint. But also, Rick Tockett holds you accountable for your actions. He, he sat down JT Miller in a game – a few games ago, and he got his point across. JT Miller came back and was awesome in a game against Edmonton in which Vancouver beat the Oilers for a third time this year. And if Demko's great, I love their blue line, Roenick and, and Quinn Hughes. They've got a top pairing there. It looks like uh, what Roenick's done uh, with Hughes. Uh, and that is a team that with the ability to score and some depth scoring, can make some noise in the Pacific Division uh, with the likes of Vegas. And then you've got Edmonton and Calgary and whether or not those teams can find themselves. Uh, Los Angeles Kings, don't look beyond them and their ability to put the puck in the net. But Edmonton's going to be the, just the fascinating club to watch. They wave Jack Campbell, and uh, Jack's got to go down, and he's got to find his game. And I don't know whether this is the precursor to something bigger for Edmonton, and they're trying to just find a way through the Campbell contract uh, dilemma uh, because he is owed uh, $20 million uh, as of uh, right now this year and, and the four more. But it's it's an interesting one. I don't think that there's enough help inside the organization to partner with Stuart Skinner to give them the goaltending they need to win on a nightly basis. Skinner might be able to do it for a while, but you need something else. So I think they, they make a trade. They either sell one of their assets up front or they go out and they they get it done with Jack Campbell coming back up. And I talked to Glenn Healy, my buddy, former New York Ranger. He was the last number 30 before Henrik Lundqvist, uh, I believe, to to wear number 30. And and Glenn's got this uh, big picture and he's got uh, I love him because he's, he's he's got this opinion, but he he said as a goaltender when it starts to go wrong, uh, you're doing the same thing, but pucks are going in, so you start doubting yourself. You're not winning games, pressure mounts. And he said the best way to explain it is you're looking through a telescope, but you're looking through the wrong end of the telescope. So while things are going great, you can see everything, you, and you can get dialed in. You can zero right in uh, through that telescope. Then you flip it around when things aren't going good, and everything is so small, and you can't... Uh, see the guy in the back door, you can't see the release point that you normally would, a puck uh, through a screen, that kind of thing. You don't react to it, and it just it goes from bad to worse, and it's a, it becomes a mental game as much as it is a, a physical game. And he said that's, that's real challenging to get through as a goaltender. And it's the second straight year that we've watched this. Cal Peterson, Los Angeles, he couldn't get through it. Ended up in the American Hockey League and now is part of a different organization in Philadelphia. I think Jack Campbell, if the Oilers are going to succeed, Jack Campbell has to find it and give the Oilers some solid goaltending. And I hope, because you want to see people succeed, I hope he does. Uh, because the, the Edmonton Oilers, it might be the best thing for them, uh, a little adversity, but boy, you, you got a steep climb ahead of you uh, going forward uh, with that part of the Oilers and their pursuit of a Stanley Cup playoff position. It was challenging for a Stanley Cup and being in the race to to try and follow up the 
Vegas Golden Knights championship a year ago. They lost to Vegas. They said, we learned from that. Well, now, now it's not about getting to the Stanley Cup final. Now it's about getting to the Stanley Cup playoffs. I want to tell you about another podcast on our platform. Check out NHL Backstory. It's a podcast hosted by Art Ocal, and it relives some of the most unique moments in NHL history. Episode one is available now and explains how Disney's Mighty Ducks movie franchise, which we all know, inspired an NHL franchise. Remember, the movie happened first, and then the Ducks franchise, or the Mighty Ducks franchise, came about. It's available at NHL.com or wherever you get your podcasts. It's a fun lesson, a, a little Hollywood and a whole lot of hockey. Uh, thanks to Bob Bender. Thanks to the Anaheim Ducks uh, making Greg Cronin available to us and uh, allowing us to have that extended conversation. And of course, Bob Bender and you, the listener. If you like what you heard, share it. And I love hearing from you. Got a lot of great reactions uh, the last couple of weeks, so keep them coming. It's the Chirp Podcast with Darren Millard. Thank you.